your media, where you are. And just like that, we are live. Uh, welcome to the transcript with me, Tiamo Mudisane. This is actually the first official show, podcast. And today I'm a bit excited mm -hmm. and honored to have one of the people who I grew up looking up to and enjoying uh, watching on TV. However, today we're not really talking much about little life on the entertainment in front of the screens, but how we got to that part. Mm -hmm. And joining me in studio today is actor, director, um, co-founder, son, um, father, mm -hmm. and brother, Somla Tandana. Hello. Welcome. Thank you very much. Hi, how are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm all right. I'm good. So, um, I think, so, just to give you a, um, just a bit of introduction. Sure. Um, as I mentioned that the title for today's interview mm -hmm. is not like father. Sure. But still son. Yes. Because um, this is something I, growing up, I realized like there was, you know, Shomla Dandala and then there was um, your dad as well. Yeah. And he's like a big man and I just never thought... I was like, how, how does that happen? Because growing up, I'm also a pastor's kid. Oh, are you? So it's always, <laughs> yeah. So it's always just that whole thing of like, you expect it to, to be a certain way. Yes. And grow a certain, yes. you know? Um, but how was that for you? And I think just to give a bit of context as to who your dad is, mm -hmm. you know, um, brief introduction that I actually wrote for you. Correct me if I'm wrong. Sure, sure. <laughs> so I'm John Pai, Shamla Tandana, born in Mdansani in the Eastern Cape. Mm -hmm. um, eldest son to former Bishop of the Methodist Church of South Africa mm -hmm. and former head of all African conferences of churches. Yes. Vume Tandana mm -hmm. and doctor. And all that. Yeah. Yes. But your mom, is your mom also a doctor? Yes. Mpume. Uh, Pumzile. Pumzile Dandana. Dandana, correct. Yes. So, and then also on the side, things that you've done, you know, co-founder of LK Theatres, award-winning South African actor, director, producer, and distributor of many local international film productions. Mm -hmm. You have over 25, 25 years, that's a lot, eh? Uh, no, it's more. Um, from 1988, so how many years is that? Almost 35 years. 35 years. Almost. Yeah, that's... Quite a lot. <laughs> yeah. That's quite a lot. Um, and yeah, as I said, you're a father of four and just a brother and mostly a son. Yes. So I think let's start yes. right at the beginning mm -hmm. with Somla growing up at age, like age six. Oh, goodness. Um, well, a couple of things. Um, you know, I, it was a normal family, normal preacher's family, which is not quite normal in many ways. Um, you're constantly surrounded by by church members and things like that. And um, your parents are constantly having to choose between you and the bigger church family. They are the usual hang-ups and expectations that come with being a pastor's kid. Um, there are places you can't go as a pastor's kid. There are things you can't say as a pastor's kid. 
you know, so, so yeah. But you don't know those things mm -hmm. until you look back and realize what other people are privy to. So and until then, all you know is that, oh, we're not allowed to do that. We're not allowed to do that. And there's consequences for that. And um, if I go and do this, a church member might see me and tell on me. And so, you know, it's just easier not to do it. Yeah. And I think that's one of the pressures, like most pastors' kids don't talk about or shy away from it, is the fact that you're always living in, 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 in fear of someone else. Telling, yes, yes. Uh, you know, yeah. Set, like you're expected to set an example, forgetting that correct. you are actually your own person. Correct, correct. Uh, and and it's a strange one because it's it's a it's a double, what's it? Double sided blade. Double edged sword. Double edged sword. Um, and it's a double edged sword in this sense. On the one hand, there's this great expectation that you'll be the best behaved kid. Mm -hmm. And so you don't get to experiment and do all those things that scar you so that you become tougher and so on and so forth. Um, you don't go to, to, to a house party under age and learn, oh, this is how you get in. This is how you uh, slip someone some money so that you can get some, oh, this is how you get beaten up by put smang yeah. and, and so, you know, and those things are important because those are the things that make you a, a tougher human being because you get scarred at the right time, you heal and learn. Uh, but you you're, you avoid all of that. And, and not only do you go through that, <laughs> the other side of it is you get infantized. So um, everyone tells you how special you are. Uh, no, 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 take my last five cents. Because uh, you know, yeah. so they, you, you, um, <laughs> there's a word I heard recently, you get pedestalized. Okay. Um, it's not a real word. Someone else might think that. But um, you get put in this uh, this pedestal mm -hmm. that you're special, and and so what starts to happen is you start to believe the hype that you are special because you're a preacher's kid. That uh, yes, you're better than those kids that go to that house party because you're a preacher's kid, and you, and you start to imbue all these judgments um, and. and only discover much later that actually you're not that special. Um, actually, there's nothing wrong with going to that house party and, 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 and it becomes a rude awakening unless, and this is where I, I was fortunate, I had a mother who anchored me severely to a fault uh, sometimes. But um, my mother was constantly a, no, you're not that special. Give that five cents back. Uh, no, you can't take the sweets from the granny. Being a preacher's kid doesn't mean Jack, it's him, not you. And so she was constantly yeah, working, you. constantly working at, at humbling me. When I look back on it, I'm incredibly grateful because it did mean that I, I go to those parties that I shouldn't have been going to. Um, it, I, I avoided the judgmentalness that comes with church and church life, especially when you're close to the inner circle of it which by being a preacher's kid, you naturally are. Uh, and so you avoid a lot of those. Um, and and even I grew to, dis to distrust things like compliments. I don't take compliments well because I grew up being told that, no, you're not that special. Oh, look, you're so nice. You're so well-spoken because you're a preacher's kid. And then my mother would be like, no, that's not a compliment. Calm yourself. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're so pretty. Man, man, man. You're yellow. That's not something to be proud of. You didn't do that. And so you start to grow this constant voice in your head that's going, well, that's a nice compliment. They put it on the side. Then, uh, yeah, it's it's so got nothing to do you with you say it. that voice is what fuels you even to this very day? We, oh, yeah. Your, your gig no matter how big your gig is, you're constantly just looking for... Well, yes, yes. Because, um, again, your achievements are expected because mm -hmm. you're, you're a preacher's kid. Um, of course you should be doing better than everyone else. Mm -hmm. So, what, I'm supposed to praise you for swimming? You're a fish. Swim. Um, and, and so you, you grow that. And so you have these achievements that you're going, well, yeah, yeah. And worse, 
people are uh, giving you compliments for those for those achievements and that makes things even worse now yeah. what you're gonna compliment no you're not complimenting me you, you like the thing that's very nice thank you thank you but i'm not taking it on board yeah. um and it kind of robs you of a huge chunk of just life experience that most other people do get to enjoy so if your mother if you come from a family that ran a shibin and you happen to be really really good in whatever chosen field you're at it's celebrated and you know how to take that on board mm -hmm. whereas if you're a preacher's kid it's very very difficult either either you're spoiled because you've been infantized and so life kicks you really hard and you end up being a drunk mm -hmm. which unfortunately happens to many 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 preachers yeah, kids. The rebelliousness. correct um because you're rebelling against the church and the judgments that come with it and 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 so either you go that way or you grow this extra thick skin that simply goes yeah i did it okay it's not a big deal let's keep it let's moving keep it moving yeah so i read somewhere that you have a nickname and it's q so what is q oh gosh how did that come about um i had <laughs> most people don't know um i had um because i went to to uh especially high school i went to a mixed school um and so was around lots of, of white kids who would butcher my name. Eventually, it was just like, look, please stop stop saying Cholomla. I don't know what Cholomla <laughs> is. Stop. And my second name starts with a, a Q. So usually on, on official um, papers, documents, whatever, it's written Cholomla, Q, Dada. Mm -hmm. And so people just went Q. And so it stuck. And that's how it stuck. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. You, you mentioned a part about your mom's influence mm. and we've just touched on growing up under your father's influence. Yes. Your mom seems like to have played a, also a very pivotal role and she's also like very educated and very like... Oh smart. yeah. Oh, so yeah. How, like, especially in school, mm -hmm. how did you navigate yourself? Um, it's, it's an... <laughs> My dad was, I'm a boy. Um, boys model themselves on their fathers. Mm -hmm. The person you're con constantly in competition with is your father. Um, and not in an unhealthy way, but in a way that, um, that my dad has set the Healthy bar here. Yeah. If my dad has set the bar here, that's what I need to reach or surpass. Mm -hmm. If I've not reached that bar, then I'm not, uh, then I'm kind of failing in achieving my goals. So my father had, um, and you, you pick the things that are important. So my father was a people's person. He had notoriety because of his work. Therefore, I need to have notoriety because of whatever field I choose. Um, my father was a people of, was a man of the people. He served. Therefore, I need to serve because that, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, and he had inherited it from his father. So my, my father and my granddad were very, very close. And my grandfather poured a lot of his love and wisdom and such into my father. And so my father constantly modeled himself against my grandfather, who was also a preacher. Okay. And so that he then passed on to me. And so I picked the things that I, I wanted to do, but I was going, you know, there's enough preachers in, in the Dandala for the family. I want to touch on that, actually. The whole... When did you then get the bug? When did you realize like this is not my route? This is like I like it's it's amazing and everything, but I never wanted it ever. The being a preacher thing mm -hmm. again because you're on the inside, so you're not watching it from outside. Watching, oh look, they stay at the big house. They have a little bit more lawn than us. Uh, you know, yeah. So do you? This is your normal. Th that was always my normal. Yeah. Uh, and and part of seeing that normal is also part of seeing um, the desperate mothers of Abashan and Ademuruti to come and put their hands, uh, put his hands on them, both in the spiritual and otherwise manner, <laughs> and seeing my father have to fight that off. Um, it's part of um, watching my dad simply not have the time to be a father to his kids 
um, because he has to be a father to the community. And he was there, he was trying, and you know, it's not, uh, this is not me faulting him, but he was in a situation. And and so the, those kind of things, I, mean, no, I, don't, I don't really want to be part of this. I don't want to sit here and listen to, um, pardon my French, but the bitching and moaning about who gets to be elected as treasurer for the church funds. I really, really don't need that in my life. And so, you know, I took what I, thought was valuable for me um, from my dad and set those bars and then try to meet them, uh, surpass them and the like. And when did the, the arts then, how did you get introduced? I have no memory of not being artistic. I have no memory of it at all. Mm -hmm. um, at Sunday school, I remember being very, very enthusiastic about putting a play together. Um, in junior school, I must have been in grade one, grade two, and I was constantly in plays. In fact, the first play that I would say I directed proper, where produced, directed, because I grabbed some stuff from home and went, this is, we're going to use this for costumes. I went to people and went, you, you're in my play. You, you're in my play. And then we workshopped it and wrote it and everything. I must have been six, six, seven, eight years old. Wow. Oh, I was... Yeah, I must have been seven or eight years old, some of that. And so it's only later that this thing that I've been obsessed with mm -hmm. got given a name. And, oh, okay, yeah. I mean, we're, we're doing the thing. Yeah, 100%. Uh, that you came and named it drama. Well, whoop de doo but we'll keep doing the thing. You just, you just answered my next question because I was going to ask you, like, did you know at the time what it was called? Like, no. For you, for you, it was just... No. At one point, it was called uh, uh, Sunday School, yes. and then it was Itachi, and then it was plays, and then it was drama, and then it was TV drama. Oh, and then suddenly it was movies, and it keeps growing, mm -hmm. and now it's called content creation. It's the same thing. It's, it's only ever been that yeah. thing to me, that, that we're telling stories. Let's tell stories. But let's, let's okay. So we've went quite a bit far. Mm, so let's let's let's, let's <laughs> just recap a bit and talk about Shamla as a brother. Okay. Um, I have one uh, direct sister. Um, my younger sister Ruben, also incredibly artistic. Um, you know, she just she has it. Um, and then I have two cousins who grew up as sisters so they they came to live with us from a very very early age who was my who was exactly my age and then who was slightly older than us so she was the big sister and things and so i was the only boy um it was an interesting childhood to grow up as a boy um you have your dad but your dad's kind of on, he's busy. Yeah, it's 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 tricky for him to make time. He's there, but not. He's there, but he's not there. Yeah, you know, um, his work has him working fourteen to sixteen hour days, so he simply isn't there, even on weekends. Um, and 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 so I grew up in this house of women. This incredibly strong woman, my mother, um, my incredibly rebellious older sister, who Okara's, my twin. Nosisa and my baby sister um, it, it was it was interesting because one grew up getting this this idea of how women perceive the world or at least little girls um, and, and and that kind of was the norm and I was watching I would especially watch my my older sister reacting and 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 you know, uh, navigating the world of boys, for instance, and how they were constant because she was very pretty. And so the, they would constantly be asking her out and all of this, and she would come home and giggles, giggles, and, oh, this boy and not that boy and all this kind of stuff. And, and they're, oh, okay, so this is what they say about us when we're not around. And, oh, this is actually what they say they want. Okay. And, and so you, you start to internalize a lot of that. Um, often to the detriment of, well, this is how a guy is supposed to ask a girl out. And so I didn't have that male voice for a long, long time. The, this male voice that said, well, this is how you approach a girl. This is the role of a man. This is how, instead I, I had this, fem 
constant, these constant female voices that were going, this is how we experience the world. This is uh, um, how we move about the world, et cetera, et cetera. So that was the one big influence. The other, which kind of played again into my um, avoidance for compliments was we were in very deep KZN um, at this time. And Unosisa was very, very dark skinned, where I was very light skinned, but like abnormally so. Like people sometimes think I'm, I'm colored, African. Colored in South Africa is okay. It's colored it's in America, America is not okay. Yeah. You're fine. <laughs> Remember where you are. And so, and so what would happen is, you know, we were at that age where we're not quite genderized yet. So you can't tell that I'm a boy, you can't tell she's a girl, because we're wearing the same t-shirts, the same shorts, and we're running around, and, and yeah. there's no real gender, per se. And and constantly, they would they would say, how was it one more say, it don't be I go, umfana, me. Oh, umfana. So, ni abafana no babi, and I go, no, she's a girl. Um, ni abana, she? And, and, and constantly, you would watch her being denigrated or mm. being being treated badly because of the color of her skin and that would grate me that that sat very 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 badly with me again pointing to the same thing compliments are not a good thing yeah, yeah. because compliments are being used to um call me a girl when i'm a boy uh, compliments are being used to denigrate my twin uh yeah so uh, I think it was Tupac's mom, which is in, in my head, just like resonates the quote I read that um, I once heard Tupac say um, that her, his mom once said to him, warning him about how the entertainment industry works hmm. in the States. And she said that they will give you the tools to self-destruct. Um, self they really will. And that's what, what you're saying now, talking about compliments. To me, it sounded like that, that compliments literally are like the tools. You think yeah, you've got yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, they literally arm you to self-destruct. I was t talking to someone, um, uh, giving a talk to, to some kids a little while ago, and I was talking about the dangers of fame that people don't talk about. Fame is exceptionally dangerous. And it's dangerous in this way. Imagine waking up one morning um, as a guy. You wake up and next to you is this woman who's lying there naked, clearly you had a thing with her last night. You can't remember her name, but she's gorgeous. And you know that um, she came to you because you're famous, and so you ended up in bed. I, gosh, I can't remember her name. Um, it's Friday, so they're picking up the bins. So you get up, and um, as you turn on the TV, there's a thing going on about how amazing you were in that show, and people are calling in and telling, oh, he was brilliant at that. My favorite party. Oh, he's so handsome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All of that. You grab the bag, right, of your bin bag, and you walk out the door. Um, as you walk out the door of your flat, there's two women who walk past and they go, oh my God, it's Shlomla Dandala, someone is Shlomla Dandala. Hi, son. Hi, hi, you ladies. <laughs> and you go down the stairs and there's a bunch of uh, people who are moving or gardeners, guys who, oh, it's a, oh, uh, Dandala, Dandala, oh, it's a, Atiyak. And so they praise you and um, you get to the, to the, to the gate and there's a security guy who's also going, ah, how are you doing? How are you doing? You walk past and um, on your way back, there are girls sitting in a car and they're looking and they giggle. You know they're talking about you. You can't hear what they're saying, but they're talking about you. Eventually you make it back to your flat. That's fame. It's that constant high all the time. Everyone 100%. telling you how amazing you are. You're amazing. You're amazing. You turn on the radio. It's telling you you're amazing. The, the girl next to you, you're mistreating her, but she's telling you you're amazing. You step outside. And so they constantly keep you in this buzz of you're amazing. Not for a day, not for a week, not even for months, for years. Mm -hmm. At some point, you have to start believing that Listen, perhaps I really am amazing. <laughs> you know? I mean, he says I'm amazing. She says I'm amazing. They say I'm amazing. I do these amazingly horrible things, and people still go on about how amazing I am. I, I misbehave on, on stage, and people go on about how amazing I am. 
Then I thought, it must be amazing. Yeah. Then you wake up one day. You turn and there's no one next to your bed. Uh, that's okay, I didn't want it anyway. You turn on the TV and they're talking about Japan. Um, you take your bin outside and you walk past these two ladies um, and they walk right past you. And you go down the stairs and there's a bunch of guys who are there. It's our future. It's our future. Yeah. Because now you own yesterday's And you, correct. And you walk and so, do you feel how empty you suddenly feel doing a simple thing? of waking up and taking the bin to the gate. 100%. And it happens today, it's gonna to happen tomorrow, it's gonna to happen this whole week, that you'll go to a bank and no one is gonna start fluttering and getting, they'll just, yes, next, someone, what do you need? Mm -hmm. And you, literally all of life is now telling you, well, you're it's no one. Yeah. No, it doesn't say that was then, it just says you're no one. You're no one. Do your thing and keep it moving. Do your thing and keep it moving. Mm -hmm. No one cares about it. And suddenly you've lost that high, that jab of high that you used to get every single day. And that's when drugs start, mm -hmm. come to play. Because now you need that high. I'm going to take it from drugs. Chase that high. But then you've touched on something which I think, you know, I've sat down and analyzed myself and I thought, we always talk about the it girl. Mm -hmm. And they, like there's a whole it girl syndrome mm -hmm. where the girls are all competing to be the next, for instance, Bonan, mm -hmm. you know. But no one ever speaks about the it boy syndrome, where we find a, a guy, make them the sexiest man or the sexiest person. They used to. Again. They used to. That that's changed. Mm -hmm. Ooh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because for me, yeah. and and here's why I'm going with it, it's, it's, it's that. In the same way that the it girl is built up, we do the same thing with the guys. Mm -hmm. And they then get this ego and they get fueled and they're thinking now, mm -hmm. I can get it, anything and everything, you know? Yeah. But then when they do, when they start living in that it boyness, mm -hmm. we then want to switch off the light. We yes. then want to say to them, but you've got multiple, whatever, do you know, you're dating this one, that one and the other, and it's a big hoo-ha when... Mm -hmm. They're just living out the things that you said they can do. Hundred percent. And I think, you know, if I look at, when I look at your life and how like when you were presenting Channel O and then you moved to Isidingo and mm -hmm. you like Derek Nati Nati was huge. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And though you were like the it boy at the time, you were like the yeah. guy. It was you and Achimohok. I was actually mm -hmm. thinking the other day mm -hmm. that we only had you. And 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 actually, correct, correct. Um, it, it, it was such a strange time that when I look back on it, but um, Derek Nyati and by extension, me was the first crossover character mm -hmm. where little grannies in Maritzburg knew Derek Nyati, but little but Gogos in Transkei knew Derek Nyati. Um, Mothers and fathers in Alex knew Derek Nyati. Uh, mothers and fathers in Santon knew Derek Nyati. So literally, it was the first proper big um, crossover. And that comes with all sorts of um, advantages. But it wasn't by accident, you see. Um, when I, I remember going to Isting, I'd been doing television for a while before that. Um, you know, I was doing kiddie shows, or Spider's Place. I used to do uh, Moving On with these teenage dramas. I used to do, um, yeah, all sorts of, uh, I was presenting all yes. over the place. Uh, you know, so it, it didn't start there. But what happened um, around that time is we had a, a meeting, I think it was out in Rosebank, with a, a very big uh, PR company at the time. And the lady who ran that, um, what was her name? Des, uh, Des something, I can't remember what was her name. And while we were all mingling, because we were getting ready, it was the, the cast meeting for the first time and all of this, we hadn't shot a frame for his team. Walks up to me and goes, we're gonna make you huge. And what? 
you have no idea. We're going to make you a star. Yeah. And with 10 years under my belt before that, I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I don't really that's know what you mean. Yeah. That, that's, that's cool, whatever. And I didn't think anything of it. And the first... How old were you at the time? I was 23, maybe 23, 24. Um, and the first time I realized that, oi, we might be proper famous now was um, SABC used to do these these road trips around the country where they would take the Simunye guys, so we were mixing with them, we were mixing with um, some key people, the, the Silom, I guess, um, you know, people that I looked up to and going, oh, wow, you're a star, you're an actor, oh, 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 and you cower around them. And then, um, you know, well, Carol Bauer were there uh, and many others. And what they did is they had the stage and the stadium would be filled literally to the brim and people would come out and do a little thing, a little song, a little dance or whatever. And it used to drive people mad. I hadn't been part of the lineup at all. Um, hadn't been invited and I was cool with it. Yeah. You know, let the famous people do the, the thing. I think that's and the thing so, about the SABC. You only know you're the big, you're bringing the big guys. Yes. When you are called into the roadshow. When you get called yeah. onto that roadshow. Then the Easter show, show then In fact, I think it was the Red Easter show mm -hmm. where I got called for the first time. And they went, and I'm like, what, what happens here? And I had my friends, who were Brian and Dave, who were huge. Um, going, no, just walk on and say hi. That's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Get on stage and say hello to everyone, and that'll be that. And they put me at right at the at the end when people would be starting to leave and, and, and this kind of thing. And I think I went on with um, Kaz, Kaz Abrams, and we used to present Channel O together. And so people go and, you know, the crowd is, it's crazy, it's crazy. Um, and then they go and now for our last one, uh, and Kaz is doing the, the introductions, he was the MC. And he goes, for our last one, please put your hands together for Shonda Dandala from Isidhi. And the place went insane. Like, you know where it's usually, and then they start to do the yeah, feet thing. Yeah, and they go, yeah, yeah. Oh, it was that. And, I'm, and now everyone at the back is looking at me like, go, guy. Go and do what? <laughs> and so I go out there and, and it gets nuts. It gets really, really nuts. Um, so I go, hello, hello, everyone. Hi, hi. And I can't remember. We did like a little, oh, hey, oh, hey, see who can make more noise thing with Kaz. Because he suddenly saw that, oh, we need to do something. Cause, yeah. Uh, um, anyway, we did that. And I went back and had everyone coming up to me. People, like I said, people that weren't talking to me prior to that or some who were friends, but nothing um, crazy and they suddenly come up to me going wow dude you you're huge you're big I'm like okay if you say so and outside they go we want more bring Shamla back and all this kind of nonsense and so yeah that was the first time I realized okay uh that this might be a thing and so by the time it, it got to things like um all you need is love well it was just ridiculous mm -hmm. but now my thing is I want to understand your mind, like what's going on right now. You're 23, mm -hmm. and at that point, I'm assuming, you know, you, 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 to you, life is just like popping. Yeah. And you just realize that you can literally walk into a room and pick anyone. And how are you then keeping to that same boy who your mom was just like, you well, I still had that. I still had that that voice in the back of my head for a long time. That, Listen, you're not calm down. Calm down. You know how people get. You go to a new church and they go, "We have Bishop Dandala with his family. Please all stand up." And suddenly you're taking accolades and applause for for being Bishop Dandala's son. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that's nice. And so I kind of took it in that spirit for a long time. You know. Um, 
Yeah, and and I had always been afraid of faith. I think again because of of my mother and that teaching. I literally grew up with a recurring nightmare that I was on stage and there was a light a spotlight on me and the place was filled with people and they were going to perform and I now have to perform and it terrified me no end. The idea of fame to this day makes me very uncomfortable. But do you not think that that would be like a vision of your destiny? Like Maybe, maybe, yeah, yeah. You know, you manifest the things that you take on board. And, yeah, there's that saying, what but, you persist, what you resist, persists. Persists. Yeah. Uh, fame is what I've always resisted, and so there yeah. it is. Um, so yes, at 23, my, my mother's voice was there all the time, all the time. It took me about five or six years of persistent, very, very, very intense fame for me to start believing that maybe I am, maybe I am the bee's knees, like everyone says. And that was the beginning of the collapse for a long time, you know, um, because around then I, I was already married, I, um, kids on the way and things were going great and I'm still famous and everyone is now wanting to say oh look 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 uh he's now married he's married this beauty queen things are great he's doing great he's doing great which is exactly the thing that um attracts people who desire the that light 100%. and can't produce it within themselves yeah and and so i started to attract those except at the time i was believing my own hype mm -hmm. uh, that, that kicked me hard in the, <laughs> in the net regions <laughs> but now let's okay so let's move to now so we've spoken about from another new person in the industry mm. and the it boy um but i want to touch on now how do we how did from then realize like or step away from it, especially because now you, you're in a marriage mm -hmm. and it's, it's all, it's nice, but it's going pear shaped. Yeah. No. So when, what, how does the wake up call happen? It, it was, um, it wouldn't come from, for a, a few years, the, the wake up call, um, because things kind of went pear shaped, uh, but career wise, I was doing okay. And I was able to say, look, I don't want to be in the spotlight anymore. And so then kicked in my directing. And so I was doing that and that was keeping me floating. And so I was able to navigate work-wise um, all of that. But life was just getting worse and worse because um, I was still stuck in the you the it guy thing. So because that doesn't stop. Just because your life is going pear shaped does not mean one hundred percent the 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 light seekers will not seek out the light, mm -hmm. um, and and so that that happened and I spun out for for many years for many years and in fact uh, there was a a tabloid writer at the time. No, I don't want to call out his name. Um, I feel like you've earned the right. Um... No, no, it's it's not fair. Um, but there was a tabloid writer who said to me right at the uh, as things were climbing, and he said, "We look forward to bringing you down." Literally, those were his words. And I remember walking away, going, "Huh?" And the other person who warned uh, warned me about it. I was um, I was with my wife at the time, and she said, "Yeah, don't believe the hype. These people that are praising you will be applauding when you are coming down." Brenda Fuzz. Oh, wow. We had a lunch with her and because she was very, she was a big That's amazing. lady and, and um, would, she picked me out. I was out uh, having dinner with my wife at the time and picked me out. I went, oh, I love her. She's so pretty and sat down. Okay, sit. I mean, you're Brenda Farsi. Let's order a meal. Uh, and we sat and we had a fat conversation. And one of the things she said, and again, I didn't take it on board at the time, was these people who are praising you will applaud when you are falling apart. Mm. I'm telling you now, 
And every time I bumped into her after that, we'd go off and have a chat in the parking in the parking lot. And she would repeat it that be careful of these people who are praising you. You're doing great and it's amazing and you're huge and all of these things, but they will eat you up. It would take another eight years or so for me to actually go, wow. The, because what happened is as things started to go pear-shaped, <laughs> I've never seen anyone with this kind of press, um, the tabloids would write about me every single 100%, week. I remember. For years. Every single, like, it was, I, you, it was you, Brenda, Pepsi. Yeah. And nothing positive. Yeah. Always negative for years. And I'd be like, but I'm sitting at home doing nothing. No, Shona's doing this. Shona, at one point as a joke, I wanted to print t-shirts going, I've had Shona's babies. <laughs> and just sell that because uh, at what, I'm making babies everywhere, left, right, and center. To this day, you can still Google and peep, there's more about my private life <laughs> than the work. that, yeah. And that sold a lot of papers. The, the, these lies and and at one point I was thinking do I sue to get them to stop no because if you sue um, then you're creating a, an even, even bigger yeah. story yeah. and so and so I was advised look just bite down and ride out the wave there is no one I am aware of in this country in the media who has had bad press consistently mm -hmm. For as long as I did, one hundred, and I totally agree. <laughs> and and at one and, and at some point you go, no man, I know I'm messing up my life, but it's nowhere near what I'm reading about mm -hmm. myself. Um, and so after a while, it was just look, clean yourself, and get back on the horse, and keep it moving, uh, and and now be aware of the fame. Mm -hmm. And so for since those days, I, I step very lightly. There are places I don't go. I simply don't. Um, and things I try not to say because that comes with its own responsibilities and, and things like that. And so, yeah. And so I did that until politics came. <laughs> and then we started we, again. We're going to attach to that because that's also... Um, but I just want to now... You mentioned something about someone saying to you, just ride the wave. Mm. And I want to understand as you're riding this wave, mm -hmm. given the context, you're a PK and all of that. You, to you, fame is not a new thing. No. But now it's just the pressures that come with it. Yeah. So what's happening? What is some other person experiencing in this ride? Because now you've, as oh, you've we've painted man. that you're, you're alone. Yes, I was ex exceptionally alone. Like, I'm alone where even family don't want to associate mm -hmm, with me mm -hmm. because now I'm dragging the family down. Uh, where I was from, like the big star, everyone could walk in and go, I'm from uh, I'm from like Danella's brother, I'm from like Danella's sister. And that same with some, came with certain advantages. The reverse is also true. Um, and so now I'm being called to the family home back in the Eastern Cape where I'm put in Esbaini uh, and Amatota coming around going, Shlomla, you are messing up. Like this, they yes. literally had an yes. intervention, a family <laughs> intervention to go enough, stop. And I'm going, I'm doing nothing. I'm being, but okay, I'll, I'll stop. I'll try and stop. I'll try because in an intervention, you can't go defensive. Yeah. You just have to take it on. So there's that. Um, and my parents are living in Kenya at the time. And so really one is exceptionally alone, mm -hmm. which is not necessarily a bad thing because, again, it's lessons you pick up from being a PK, is that, yes, you're part of this big crowd, but actually you're alone because um, I've lived in KZN a lot for, for a long time, but I'm not Zulu. And everyone around me is not is Zulu, but not even like um, superficial Zulu. I'm a Zulu Yeah. Um, and so and I, there's a certain level where we just don't connect and where you become an other, you're an outsider. Um, and then we go and live in, in the Eastern Cape uh, in PE. 
except now your Xhosa is not the same as their Xhosa because your Xhosa is actually more important or aggressive Irish, plus you speak Zulu. So you're not quite Xhosa, you're Xhosa by name, but <laughs> until you become, but even then you'll always remain, um, what did they call me? Uh, something like Ichaga, which was, which is kind of a derogatory name for Mzulu. Okay. Um, and so when I'm in KZN, I'm, I'm Zulu. Um, then we moved to Joburg, but in Joburg, Uyikotuga, as Sumisi yes. likes to call us. <laughs> Uyikotuga, so you're not really from here. From here. Yeah. Plus, you haven't lived in any of the townships from here. So, what kind of black are you, yeah. actually? No, you must be a, a coconut. So, okay, you're a coconut because you went to a white school, plus, you didn't live in the townships. And you're going, well, no, actually, I lived in the rurals of the most. Anyway, and so one had been accustomed to wherever you are, there's going to be a point where you become an outsider. And so with the fame, it was pretty much the same thing. Suddenly I'm an outsider. Um, suddenly all my friends, all the people I thought were friends are suddenly, you know, stepping back a lot. Um, and, and so, you know, I'm back in my solitude and I had made a nice comfortable spot for me in the solitude. I did so when I was six years old. I did so when I was 13 years old. I did so when I was 15 years old. So, you know what, that's cool. Mm -hmm. Everything is, and so you live this lonely life where you wake up and you do what you need to do. And you become really, really selective about the people you let back into your life. Because as the song says, when you get back on your feet again, everybody wants to be your long lost friend. 100%. But now, I've, I've often wondered, especially growing up reading all the tabloids and understanding the whole dynamic, mm. was was there no point that your dad um, called you? And if he did, what was the conversation? Because I'd assume he'd literally be like, chief. Yeah, he did. He did. Um, see, my dad was always... Uh, he was where I had my mother's voice anchoring me all the time mm -hmm. um, to a fault. <laughs> my my dad's voice was always be the best, be the best. You're not the best yet. Be the best. Mm -hmm. Whatever you do, if you're going to be a director, be the director. If you're going to act, be the actor. If you're going to and and so I was failing that voice. Mm. Um, and and when I eventually I remember flying up to to Nairobi to to my dad and just going listen it's all falling apart my marriage is falling apart work I, I'm messing up everywhere and we had a it was the second time we'd had the conversation where he just let me be a child all over again and and break down and cry and all of these things and then he was like look. Um, the trick to all of this is now you need to choose what you're going to commit to I, because you can't have it all. Are you going to commit to being the star and fight to get that back, your star status and all of that? Are you going to fight to be a good husband? Are you going to fight to be a good father? Are you going to, what is it? What do you want? And I said, look, I've messed up with everything. The one place I've not messed up yet is being a father so i will commit to that and he said okay that we can do and so we started to strategize around how do you become that especially in this and then know that everything else needs to be water off a duck's back they will badmouth you and i went yes and they're doing so he went it's going to get worse and he was right um you're not going to get your love life in order for a long time because you need there are lessons you still need to learn uh, and, and so the conversations I've I've had with my dad and and it was really um, forward thinking on his on his part is we've had father son conversations versus um, son preacher mm. so anytime we discuss Christianity anytime we discuss the Bible is only when I bring it up and go listen I read this unpack for me and even then he won't preach to me he will speak to me look this is my understanding and this is where my faith is that it's informed by this and this and i go yeah but how do you then reconcile these things and he goes look i've had to make 
the choice that what my faith and such is in contradiction with certain realities and they are realities mm -hmm. but this is where the edge of my grasp uh, is mm -hmm. beyond that is somebody else's lawn and i can't be responsible for somebody else's lawn i'm only responsible for mine so okay touching now on shomla is the husband mm -hmm. what who was he or how was he and looking at it now what are the things you would change wow firstly i wouldn't be a husband <laughs> um as a husband gee um i don't i don't know um for a while I, look i know myself as a partner not necessarily a husband uh, i'm not sure what being a husband per se no i do know i do know now <laughs> i didn't then so he, the fallacy i believed for a long long time was that marriage is about love if you have love everything else clicks into place i don't believe that anymore i think love is a nice to have in a marriage um so it's not like njolo njolo i love you you love me let's make it happen yeah. when your love finishes or my love finishes end of the yes. correct and so i had understood marriage to be like that and marriage is is my new understanding is marriage is not like that marriage is first and foremost a business decision it, it requires a sense of duty it requires a sense of commitment in ways that you can't believe um you'll ever be tested um it it requires a certain strength of character it requires the ability to go i know what you're saying and it sounds right but i can't take it on board because my priority is this marriage the second you have anything more important than the marriage that thing will creep up on you and you will be faced with the the choice um and and um one of the reasons many marriages fail is because on the one hand we're teaching people to be true to themselves first and at the same time we're saying get married and marriage says no be true to me before you're true to yourself mm -hmm. and so those things find themselves at odds and uh, many times marriage that takes the uh a uh, back seat, the seat and then falls apart so as as a as a, a husband i think i suffered pretty much the the same kind of delusions i believed love i believed that marriage needs to serve me and not me serve the marriage i believed um that when marriage wasn't serving me i was within my rights to go and find that thing that served me mm -hmm. uh because i was the most important thing and so at a point i went and sacrificed my marriage um and 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 marriage doesn't work like that um yeah and and as per agreement with my dad back in nairobi many many years ago once those kind of things started to fall apart my commitment was i will be a good father to my children come hell or high water uh in poverty in health uh, in what sickness and health, health in poverty in so richness in i kids. am married to my kids before anything yes. else um which is something you I must applaud you for because you've done it quite well i think you know as much as media can say whatever mm -hmm. one the one thing we can't get against you or go against is how much of a good father yeah you are yeah i and guess how dedicated you are to your that's kids. that's the choice that was made all mm -hmm. those years ago when i tried to stay true to and it. what has been the because I, i believe as much as like in my understanding marriage relationship is a decision mm -hmm. so when you decided you want to be a perfect the, the not perfect but a good father to your kids mm -hmm. what was the constant decision you've had to make every day when you wake up to put like put you on the path to keep you on the path um bo 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 it's it's a it's a set of rules 
I guess, uh, for myself, um, including things like um, just time schedules, just managing schedule. Things like saying, I will dedicate an hour a week per child where it's no no one else, just us two, and let them speak whatever. Um, I dedicate that work cannot be more important than my children. My own financial success cannot be more important than my children. My relationships, whether marriage or ujolo, cannot be more important than my my children. And, and those things keep coming up. So you'll, you'll meet someone and she's lovely and all of these things, but not really all about the children. Oh man, that's a pity. We were getting along so well. I mean, you say things and my soul lights up, but uh, I'm sorry, yeah. my kids. I have to be about my kids. Oh, here's a job that's going to take you to LA and you know, you'll start again, but we're going to make you huge. We're going to make you Will Smith. That did happen, by the way. Um, and LA meant, um, someone who had the kind of influence where they said quite clearly again, look, um, uh, um, Hollywood works in tropes. You fit the Will Smith trope. He's built it up, but now he needs to, and we need a Maybe, replacement. Yeah. And you are exactly the right age, the right skill, all of these things. You can be this, but you need to come by yourself. Uh, I can't take it, I'm sorry. I, I wish I could, I, but I can't. I can't. I've got children back at home. I can't leave them, so I'm flying back home. And so you sacrifice that, and and so on. So it's it's those kind of constant, constant things where um, I will default financially on my house, on my car. I will never default on my school fees. Mm -hmm. I, you know. Yeah. And how have you managed to keep your kids out of the same as, as I said, being the or the pressures like growing up under um, your father's shadow. How do you navigate them not growing up under some of the values? We stay away. Um, in the mornings, we we had this thing where we would wake up and clean the house, very much like any, like many black families where you put on the radio and we know Saturday, uh, young one, the porch, you, dishes, you, there. And then, and so the, the whole house is cleaning with the mm -hmm. radio blasting in the background. And um, I can't remember whether it, it was Joe and, Joe and Pearl Tusi had a show um, where they used to compose about people and stuff. Um, and they started talking about me and you know the usual tabloid stuff he's a bad this children everywhere yada yada he's a bad father he's a bad husband he's a bad he's a bad and oh you won't believe what he did you know what he's the donkey of the week the usual stuff and i hadn't heard it the kids started da, da, they're talking about you and i walked across and i heard the things they were saying and the kids were listening to and I was so upset that I phoned Joe immediately. I went, dude, you and I go way back. Like we were young boys together. We were presenting Channel O together. I've known you for that long. How is it that when you have that kind of access to me, you are able to spread rumors that you know are untrue? Um, anyway, we had that back and forth. But the lesson, the big takeaway, which has helped to answer your question, um, was we don't have a TV in the house. We don't watch any of my content at all. Not even the river. We do. I've never watched the the river. So no, when you're saying you don't have TV, like no Netflix, nothing like. We've only just gotten that, and they watch it on their tablets and things. But this <laughs> this culture of gathering around the television because it's time to watch. X or Y, mm -hmm. we don't do that. Um, it stopped that day. Um, we don't do communal radio listening. We don't do the content you want. You must go and find it yourself. Mm -hmm. 
And my job as the father is to then hop around bedrooms going, hey, let's talk. What are you listening to? Oh, I'm listening to uh, Blackpink. Or oh, I'm listening to Justin Bieber. Or oh, I'm listening to um, Somizi or whatever. Yeah. Right? But, the, but I am quite strict about keeping the content I create away from the kids. Not because I think it's inappropriate, but it's inappropriate for me, for my children to see me as anything other than their father. Their father. And so when we walk in a mall or if we're walking down the street and people go, ooh, 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 they'll go, da -da, you're famous, hey. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Wow, how does that feel? I'm like, Dude, I live with you. You tell me. Yeah. And I go, that's exactly it. it. It means nothing. And so, yeah, that side of things I'm working very hard until they, they can define for themselves uh, who they are. They should not be in contact with that side of things. Again, for the same reason, because children don't model on what you say. They model on what you do. are, yeah. what you do. Uh, and I don't want to be that to my children. Otherwise, I'll give them. Have you picked up any one leading into the arts? Like all of them. All of them. They is it a fear of yours, or is it just like? Stage? No, just by themselves. So it is a fear. It is. Um, so so I watched my my daughter doing a play the other day, and I sat in the audience, tears streaming. Just she's. It's a strange thing. When someone has it, they just have it. They, it it's not, if you take them to varsity, yes, you can upskill them, but they've got that light, that thing. Um, all the ones I've seen. Uh, I've seen two daughters on stage. I've seen my boy um, doing videos, and then they get the siblings in, and they, it scares me cold. They all had it, that that light, that thing. Um, the same thing that my father has, it actually. But he expressed it as being a preacher. Yeah. So if you see my father on the pulpit, he is amazing. He is an amazing, amazing preacher. Because they've got that light where you can't but lean forward when they're, yeah. when they're talking. Um, yeah, we're going to have to wrap this conversation. There's still so much. But lastly, um, I just want to know what's the biggest misconception of Shona Dunana that there is? Oh, gosh. I don't know how people perceive me, so I, I don't know. Uh, I, I try and, and stay clear of it. Oh, I'll tell you one. Mm -hmm. um, The, there's this idea that when you do a, a character, you become the character. Mm -hmm. And South Africans, a lot of uh, our viewing South Africans battle with separating the actor from the character. Um, so I'll do a character and I'll be speaking pure Zulu in it. And then you speak closer. Um, then you speak English. Uh, you know, um, and so I am not any of the characters I've played. Not by a long shot, including Zweli. Please, people. I'm not that idiot. Uh, idiot is the wrong word, but I am not that wit. But, you know, yeah, uh, uh, people choose to believe that. Uh, that's a misconception. Okay. And then in conclusion, I have a segment called From Your Lips to My Ears. Mm -hmm. And that's basically just you giving parting words, something you've, it could be a lesson you've learned or something which was imparted into, on, into you, onto you, something you would like to someone else who is, you know, a fan of yours or just interested in molding their lives alongside yours. Don't ever mold your lives alongside mine. Um, at best be in competition with me. Mm -hmm. But don't try and be me. You can't be. Be you. But let that you achieve more. Um, you've got to want things for yourself. You've got to want things. Um, 
that make you a better Thomas, a better Caesar, a better Sarah, a better whomever. You know, you, you can't say I want to be like. There's no one I'm aware of who's ever been a great success by being somebody else other than themselves. But that's not the parting word. <laughs> I don't think I was going to ask if, if that's the parting word. No. The, the, the parting word uh, is, a, is a, something that my, my um, martial arts teacher likes to say, uh, which is, those places that are nice to touch are not nice to touch. The things that give you pleasure are also the things that will bring you down if you're not careful. Yeah. And I think we're going to leave it right there. I would have liked to touch on a bit of the politics, <laughs> but I feel like that's a, whole, <laughs> that's a whole different, like another, we need a separate hour for that. Um, so I'm going to thank you so much for coming through and thank you for wanting to be part of my actual first show. Well done. Um, we, we wish you all the luck. Thank you. Um, may it be a great, great, great success. Thank we you so you much. We wish you well. Um, okay. Is it good on what platform? Your media, so we launched yesterday. Okay. Um, and it's like YouTube, and let me just end this.